Hi, Paul J. Leslie here today with a very uh, interesting guest, and that's a dear friend of mine, Courtney Armstrong, who I feel is one of the great uh, proponents of uh, treating trauma ethically, compassionately, and creatively is uh, with me today. And uh, Courtney is the uh, founder and director of the Trauma Informed Hypnotherapy Institute. Uh, she's uh, presently based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. She's author, author of several books. Her most recent, I believe, is called Rethinking uh, Treating Trauma. Is that the correct title, Courtney? Rethinking Trauma Treatment. Trauma Pretty treatment. close. Yeah. I, I'm listexic. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> but Courtney and I have been friends for so many years, and uh, I, I think we just uh, enjoy talking any chance we can get. So thanks for uh, speaking with me today. It's a pleasure, Pa. I always enjoy talking to you. Not yeah. only do you always get me thinking about things in a different way, but you're just, you always crack me up and make me laugh. So I enjoy that. <laughs> well, it's a win win then. Well, yeah. um, for those who don't know you, um, I'd like you to start a little bit about uh, your background as far as what brought you to uh, kind of becoming uh, focused on. Uh, trauma. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about hypnosis and trauma treatment in a little bit, but just kind of this overall idea of where, you know, what's the journey that brought you to working with trauma and then to creating your institute? Well, you know, when I first started my training and when, when I was in graduate school, I went to graduate school in New Orleans. So I got a graduate assistantship to the University of New Orleans. And part of what I wanted to do is work with kids and teens when I first got into the field and they, they had a program that was just really interesting to me working with some of the inner city schools in New Orleans and New Orleans is such a creative yeah. place. And even though this was pre Katrina, this was in you know the nineties, but gang violence was at an all time high. And my family thought I was completely insane for wanting to go to New Orleans and work with kids in gangs. Like they're like, what are you thinking? And I, you know, freaked out a little bit once the reality hit me, like, what am I thinking? Yeah. But um, what I saw were some of my friends who were artists and musicians and even gardeners. Um, I had this eclectic group of friends down there and they were doing some really creative things with the students and it was helping them feel like they had um, another purpose, that they had value, that their life could go forward, that they weren't stuck. Right. You know, part of what the reason why they get in gangs is because it's a family and it's protection. It's not just I want to be, you know, a gangster and sell drugs. That's not, it's so much more than that. So anyway, what I saw is if you give them another platform, another way to envision their future mm -hmm. and, and themselves and their relationship to the world, they could change their life. Um, and so even though at the time I was not yet trained in hypnosis, um, what I found is that when we went into the schools, I was told to use cognitive behavioral therapy and it did not really work <laughs> with these students, you know, and I even felt ridiculous suggesting to them, oh my gosh, when they tell me, I, I, you know, I'm not going to live to be past 21, don't you, Miss Courtney? You know, I don't, I'm never going to get out of the projects. Now, it was very hard for me to have a straight face and say, well, let's talk about how that's a cognitive distortion and that's all or nothing. You know, like I'm being a little bit facetious as I'm describing it to you, but I was like, I, I know that this is a, you know, negative perception of the world and I want to help them change it. Mm -hmm. But this is not the way they're not going to believe me. I mean, they would say you're a white woman. <laughs> you have no idea doors open for you that aren't going to open for me. And was that a cognitive distortion? Nope. <laughs> so I started looking for something else. I was like, this is limited and I need another way, even because I'm not a talented artist or musician, I can't use that tool, but what else can I use to help create a new experience for these kids? 
to help them believe their life has possibilities. And I found that through hypnosis. <laughs> And, um, and it's not that I put kids in trance. I didn't. Um, but I started going to the um, New Orleans Society of Clinical Hypnosis meetings mm-hmm. and, and as a student. And, um, and what I picked up from those meetings is just the how to create, how to focus on possibilities. Like you talk about in your book, not the pathology, but the possibilities. Mm-hmm. And, right. and so I took that concept away from that and it, and it worked. Like when I started saying, you know, to them, I get it that, that, um, you are in a situation that feels limiting and yet let's imagine what's, what I see in you and what could be possible. And, um, without getting too far afield from that, it really started to open the doors, but it was, I needed more. I needed more than I had at that time. So I, I knew how to start giving them some hope, but I really needed more skills in the, and I developed those over the years, but I'll stop there and let you chime in. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it, so much, I believe of your work is based in creativity. It's almost yeah. forced you to access what you already had um, yes, but it's kind of, I just get the image of, of you being kind of chained up. And then it's finally when you said, okay, enough of this. And you just kind of learn to flow with whatever, um, yes. you know, you kind of found your way a little bit, which I think is kind of inspiring, you know, when you kind of let go of, you it, know, yeah. it is, you know, I mean, I, so when you learn the theories and our training in counseling and psychotherapy and psychology. I mean, the theories, they're good. It gives you a good structure, but then the way to get there. So, you know, Adler, Beck, I mean, all of them talked about, we've got to help people change their perception of things in order to pull out of depression, anxiety, trauma, but the tools they suggested, uh, you know, I found when you open yourself up, like you said, and the and the it's really the New Orleans kids who mm-hmm. you don't have to be wildly creative, but your clients are. Right. And so I find the thing is we're trying to do something that stimulates their own creative mm-hmm. realizations, problem solving, because that's like when kid I often tell the story in our groups in New Orleans he would draw these really amazing athletic shoes and and I was just watching this like while we're in grief you know he's just drawing shoes over there (laughs) but that was fun with me it kept him calm you know I mean it was therapeutic for him and then um when he told me you know one of my jobs was to try to encourage them to consider post-secondary education like vocational schools if not college um and he said miss courtney that we only have three options you not understand that in our world uh, we could play for the nba by some miracle that's one thing that's our number one you know hope that some miracle happens there we could um work at mcdonald's or we could sell drugs so what do you think we're going to do and most of us won't live to be past the age of 21. They, they consistently said those things over and over. And I said, but Centel, look at, look at these beautiful athletic shoes that you're drawing. I used to be in the shoe business before I was in mental health. And it, I said, you've got them anatomically correct. Like Nike could use somebody like you that has this kind of vision. Now, I'm not suggesting you call Nike or Adidas today and get a job, but if you want to get into graphic design school, I mean, it may be like a year of graphic design training, get a certificate. You could do something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Whoa, wow. And, Mm -hmm. and then their kids began to bring me their artwork or their writing. And they said, what do you think I can do? What do you think? And that's what you want to do is use what they're bringing. Like you talk about an, Erickson talked about utilization. So utilize what they're already bringing in terms of creativity or what you can see in terms of their resourcefulness that you can say, how the heck did you live through that? I mean, that's what I'm interested. That's what I often will say to clients is like, you know what? I get, 
I mean, I may not do it in the first session when they're disclosing something pretty horrific to me. I'm not, you know, I'm going to be there to validate and provide the compassion and empathy it deserves. But at some point, I'm going to say, you know, I can't get over like how you got through that and and are as sane as you are. Like that's if I'm a journalist writing an article on this traumatic event, that's what I'm interested. That's the story to me, how you survive. So mm-hmm. let's focus on that. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it's such a, it was such a turning point to take that approach with clients and for them, like I've never had a client say, nah, <laughs> most of the time they were like, they're like, I don't know. I never thought about mm-hmm. that. Right. And you know, and sometimes they're reluctant to let go of that trauma identity. So I'm not going to be calling Anna about it. I mean, sometimes I don't want to overplay my, you know, optimism with them. But, but I think just the fact that you're, and that's what Pierre Genet, who was our pioneer psychiatrist in trauma treatment, he used hypnosis. And what he consistently talked about is creating an act of triumph for the person and that's what would break that PTSD spell or trance and so this is what I I want to help people bring more into their work even Mm -hmm. if you're not you know calling what you do hypnosis so much of so many of the so-called, you know, effective evidence-based trauma therapies today actually grew out of hypnosis. I mean, EMDR and Francine Shapiro admits that. She says the float back technique is the affect bridge from John Watkins, hypnoanalyst. Mm -hmm. Um, Her light stream technique and she uses desired future self, like a lot of the imagery techniques they use in EMDR, safe place. I mean, these are all hypnosis yeah. tools. The, the, even the eye movement, uh, there's uh, some tie into John Grinder's work in neurolinguistics. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, just since you're bringing that up, um, you know, some really good therapies now, like uh, we're, uh, we're talking about uh, internal family systems, which is growing. Uh, um, Schwartz uh, work, but a lot of that's rooted in influences where he got his ideas. People who came up from that early work was rooted in hypnosis as well, wasn't it? It was. So John Watkins, Ego State Therapy, and John Mm -hmm. Watkins, if if you guys haven't heard of him, was a hypnoanalyst, Mm -hmm. but he worked a lot with PTSD in the military and Mm -hmm. developed Ego State Therapy, which is the original parts work. And then you know, transactional analysis was in there too, like the parent adult child, like it's not a, the parts work concept is not a new thing, but the reason why it continues to hold the prominence is because it's effective. Mm -hmm. You know, some people really get a lot out of being able, and that's one of the things hypnosis helps people do. It's how, how to compartmentalize some things so that you can look at it a different way that it feels more manageable and that you can get enough emotional distance from it to face it and then change it change how your mind is processing it Mm -hmm. and one thing um, i want to point out is that it is interesting lately i've noticed and i'm speaking for myself not for courtney how little attention is being spent on learning practical hypnosis for the therapist, even though that, I mean, it's out there, but these other uh, therapies and theories we're talking about, I mean, they're huge, but to me, I kind of think it might be a good idea for people who study that or anything to go back to this, because if you go back to the history of psychology, of psychotherapy specifically, uh, we we usually say it started uh, as far as a, a distinct school with Freud, who started in hypnosis under Charcot. So we talked about Genet. We, Charcot was doing, who's a neurologist, was using uh, hypnosis with patients. And it, this has been up until really, you're talking about uh, the turn of the century in the 1900s to where we started to see more of the cognitive 
models, behavioral models coming in. But that, that early chunk is so based uh, on uh, unconscious, uh, even though they wouldn't use the Freud, I don't think was a particularly good hypnotist, but a lot of his things, free association is a mild trance state. So uh, having said all that, I want to redirect it back to, well, what led you specifically uh, to, to hypnosis for the trauma? And I also, I've been wanting to ask you this is, how did you take all this vast information about hypnosis and the treatment of trauma and, and streamline it into what I consider an incredibly effective program that people uh, who have a background in mental health can learn fairly quickly. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, after finishing up in New Orleans, you know, and I got inspired uh, with some of the things I learned in, in hypnosis from going to those meetings, but then um, I did pursue some training in it. Um, and I, my first training was with Ash, but then I got trained with Bill O'Hanlon and Bill has a strong, he had a strong interest in treating trauma with hypnosis, but I, that's where I learned a lot of the Ericksonian principles. And then I met um, John Connolly, uh, who developed a, a therapy called rapid resolution therapy, but a lot of it's treated in hypnosis, but, and John is, fascinating to watch but his model he's so intuitive it's like Erickson and everybody was like I don't why did you do this with this person and not this person and you know so I was inspired by these people but I, I felt like a lot of people would leave the trainings and even I did initially like going well wait a minute I wanted a structure mm -hmm. so I started studying and I got trained in other trauma therapies like EMDR because trauma became what I loved. I was shocked that trauma became the thing that I love to work with because it used to scare the bejesus out of me. Right, yeah. it, when I was working with those New Orleans kids and some of the stories they tell me, I'm like, you know, I am not prepared for that. You know, what did I, what was I thinking? But then you, what I loved about and love about working with trauma is I just found the people who've experienced trauma are very strong people. That's why they're still alive. You know? <laughs> I mean, they may have other issues from it, but I mean, it, to me, it's just so fascinating to work with them and utilize their strengths and, and see the transformation. That said, um, I started learning as much as I could about trauma. And then I started to, for myself, Paul, I wasn't trying to come up with a model that I was going to teach people or research just in my own mind to make it simpler I thought okay what are the things that all effective trauma th therapies have in common and I used the acronym RECON R-E-C-O-N because this is what I found one you recall the memory you do have to pull it out of the memory network for a moment not for an hour just just bring up the image of it or just you know, the second thing they all have in common is look at the negative beliefs that you associate with that experience. What did, and so I have a simple way I ask people, and this is, those of you trained in EMDR, it does sound familiar. It's going to sound familiar to you, but there's a twist I'm going to talk about that's different from EMDR. And that, um, so instead of saying, and Paul, what negative cognitions did you associate with that event? Your subconscious mind thinks like a child or an animal. It doesn't know what the heck you're talking about when you ask that question. And where the belief is stuck is at the subconscious level, but where the emotional brain is. Mm -hmm. so, so how many times have our survivors of trauma said, I know it wasn't my fault intellectually, but I can't stop feeling right. the guilt. Right. It's because your emotional brain is still attached that meaning to it. So the way you do, so with recon, you pull up just the memory for a moment and then you ask, what did it feel like it meant about you when that happened? Yeah. That is a question your emotional brain can answer. So if a four-year-old cannot understand the question, <laughs> your emotional brain can understand it. So you have to ask it in a way that's very simple and direct. So I ask, 
What did it feel like it meant about you when that happened, Mm -hmm. that it was my fault? And what did it feel like it meant about the people involved or people in general, you know, that they don't care about me? me. And what did it feel like it meant about the world or your future, that I have no future? Um, You know, just as an example, what someone might say. And then I'll, and then the next thing I want to ask is what do you want to believe now? Because what we want to do with therapy is we want to change those negative beliefs that are keeping them stuck, right? So then I say, well, what do you want to feel about that event now? If we could look at it in a different way or knowing what you know now, how would you want to feel about yourself? Well, I know it's not my fault. So I want to feel like, you know, this thing happened. I did the best I could to manage it. It, it was bad, but I, I did draw some strengths from the situation in spite of it. Right. Um, what do you want to feel about other people? Well, that there are people out there you can't trust, but I want to feel like, but there are people I can trust and I'm better able to recognize who they are and what qualities I'm looking for in someone who's trustworthy. And what do you want to feel about your future that I can, that I can move forward in spite of this event that I do have possibilities and opportunities. Now, I realize some people may not be able to give you those thoughts. They may say, I don't know. I don't see anything I could believe. You as a therapist may have to help them get to that place. So that's part of E in recon is exploring beliefs, exploring the negative beliefs and exploring what they want to believe. But then C in recon is create a new experience, a new meaning experience. Mm -hmm or what we commonly call a corrective emotional experience that can help them actually believe those new desire beliefs are possible. And that's where the hypnosis comes in. Mm -hmm. And it can be very simple. So if they say, I want to believe that it wasn't my fault or that I can trust people, I can't trust everybody, but I, that I know I can discern what qualities I'm looking for in a person to know that I can trust them, then I might create, I might take them into a brief hypnotic induction and say, let's do that. Let's pull up a time where you did. It may even be your dog. (laughs) It doesn't have to be a person, but what I want you to get in touch with the, what it feels like when you're with somebody that, you know, has your back or that you can trust. Mm-hmm. And, and take them deeper into a felt experience right. that brings that and integrates that more deeply into their psyche and their conscious mind as well. And, and it only has to be, it can only be a five minute induction and it can still be effective, or you could do like a lengthy 20 minute induction. But what I find or maybe we're doing the, we want to create an experience that helps them recognize it wasn't their fault. Then I might have them do a technique you guys have probably heard of where let's, let's imagine, you know, you looking at that memory, but as an adult or as an older self, even if your older self is only a year older, like the trauma happened last year, but let's just look at it now. What do you want to tell that? younger self now you know but when you do it through a hypnotic experience there's a few things that happen one when we go into a hypnotic or trance state we slow down our brain waves into more of an alpha and particularly with hypnosis it's theta band waves and what we know from neuroscience and I have some articles that reference this. When we get into a theta wave state and present that corrective emotional experience, your brain actually integrates it more deeply and more permanently. Mm-hmm. So the brain is better able to integrate a new experience in that state that hypnosis creates. And then the other thing we know is from memory reconsolidation research which is one of my favorite things to talk about. I haven't gotten into. That's where I get the acronym RECON. Back in the year 2000, neuroscientists discovered the way to update a memory network is you present the old experience, like which would just be recall the memory, and then you 
directly juxtapose a new experience that gives it a new meaning or a new context. Right. right. And when you do that, the brain goes, wait, that's different. I never, I never thought about that before. Right. And then it, it, it's like it opens to that new information. So hypnosis, we get them into that theta state. We present the new experience and the brain can better integrate that information. And what I have found when I do it this way, and I've been doing it this way for over a decade now, consistently, my clients are saying, oh my gosh, now that memory feels totally different. Right. Right. I felt completely different about myself. This is so weird. How did you do that? What just happened? Like, mm -hmm. but it's always a positive, like they're like, wow. And then my next part of recon that I'll just say briefly, the O in recon is okay. Now objectively describe that memory with the, but this time put in the new experience you just had retell, basically retell the story of the trauma, but this time insert that experience we just had and I do that to just get it integrated in that left hemisphere. Right. The verbal yeah. narrative needs to get. So the, the mismatch experience is what they call it in the memory reconsolidation research. The mismatch experience or the corrective emotional experience. Mm -hmm. You create that first with the hypnosis. Then you bring them out and you have them retell the story after having had that corrective experience even if it's just for a moment and the story changes mm -hmm. and it's the coolest thing. And then the last part of recon is the end. I call it new narrative integration. And you just have them repeat the story again, a couple of times just to keep, we're just reinforcing it in their mind, like with the new meaning or the new context. And I'm telling you, it's so neat that it's gentle. People don't ever feel re-traumatized when we do it this way. Mm -hmm. Because when we create that new experience with hypnosis, it's always, I'm always trying to create a positive. Right. I'm not trying to regress them back into the trauma memory. If we're going to look back at the memory, I always have them do it like outside, you know, dissociated from it, not associated into it which is another thing I learned how to do through hypnosis, how to have it dissociated enough so that it doesn't re-traumatize them. And, and, um, and so I just, it, it, it's easier than people think it's, I mean, you, you do have to get creative sometime on how you're going to create that new experience with the hypnosis. So it, it takes a bit of a practice and getting the feel of it in the beginning. But once you get the gist and the structure of it, you'll be surprised at how, how quickly you can help somebody reconsolidate a memory in a way that's more, um, you know, palatable and right. often uplifting and, mm -hmm. and the hypnosis calms the nervous system. So they're not just still in the fight or flight while they're talking to you about it. They're, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, uh, and one thing I think it's important to point out, and you mentioned, but the, the level, you're going to this, and these are my words, a higher level of complexity, because when you start bringing in the idea of the identity of the person, too, you know, what does that say about you? You know, what, do, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Uh, I've done interventions with people where uh, we don't even directly address the trauma sometimes because it's sometimes it's not the trauma. It's as you wisely put, it's what they're feeling about themselves. So if someone says, you know, this happened to me and that causes me to get anxious and angry and fearful, and I'll ask them, okay, well, what kind of person feels that? And they may initially say me, I say, no, what kind of person? They'll say uh, a weak person or a, 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 you know, a frightened person. So it's now the identity is there. And so finding exceptions to when they do and or activating an old memory of not being frightened or not being weak alone can you know, create incredible changes in people because it's like they're, they're cut off uh, from, from those resources. And I think you're very wise to say, okay, well, it's not about this. It's, it's actually out here, how we're processing this and then forming these 
more higher complex uh, themes and, and stories about this other theme and story, and then another theme and story. And I, I find that your work in particular, but hypnosis in general, when used appropriately, is just masterful at, at, at being able to change those things. I'm so glad you're saying that because it is so much about how that trauma influenced someone's identity. And you don't even have to talk about like with those kids in New Orleans, mm -hmm. we rarely talk about the trauma. Mm -hmm. um, th that it's not always necessary. It's whatever, right. you know, when you give them a different experience of themselves, right. it'll often right. just kind of take care of that without even sometimes having to directly talk about the trauma. Now, in, in cases where you do have to, and a lot of times you just, you, you got to talk about it. I mean, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, you have been doing some really fascinating work. I just want to bring up uh, working with the um, United States Veterans Administration lately, actually training. It, it's in a small program that, that's, you know, all around the country, training their therapists to use these processes to help veterans when uh, there's a pretty clear cut uh, uh, trauma. You know, you, you can you can have... Um, complex trauma in people for you know, long-term childhood trauma but you're talking about periods of time where it is completely focused and uh, you have to kind of talk about that first of all I, I really appreciate that you're bringing that uh, to uh, a, a population of professionals who have not had access to this material and I, I'm really thankful of that but I want to want to ask you what has been uh How's that program been working for you? And what do you what have you gotten out of working more instead of being a clinician, being a trainer of clinicians who are daily dealing with trauma? Yeah, that is a great question. I love this project. And I feel so fortunate that they invited me to participate in. And so you guys know we Paul is also one of our instructors in that program. So we brought Paul on to help us. Um, you know, train these clinicians. And, you know, the program started in the middle of COVID in 2020. And, and so we were just right smack in the middle of everybody going through trauma, you know, while you're trying to work with trauma. But it has been a resounding success. And with the clinicians, now, the VA has some very clear policies about how they work with trauma. So the VA still um, wants clinicians to utilize first line evidence-based trauma treatments like prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy. But what we're showing them is how you can use hypnosis as a tool integrated with those therapies to make it more um, effective and tolerable. So all of the re all of the research that's ever been done that looks at CB cognitive behavioral therapy as a standalone therapy compared to CBT with hypnosis, CBT plus hypnosis always demonstrates it's more effective. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's because you're targeting you know two different parts of the brain, and there's probably a lot of other things that about that, but. So what we're showing them is how you can use hypnosis, at least in the phase one of trauma therapy, which is where you're just doing preparation stabilization, right. where you're just using hypnosis as a tool to help them learn how to relax their body again, or how to sleep better at night, or how to deal with pain, especially pain that's related to trauma, um, or just, you know, how to um, find a way to um redirect their mind when they're in the flashback because like a flashback I mean our our friend Bill O'Hanlon said PTSD is a bad trance that's what it is all trance is is you're so absorbed into something that you've blocked out awareness of other things and a flashback is like a bad trance so so what we're teaching them is how you can use hypnosis to kind of manage the symptoms of PTSD in the beginning before they're ready for prolonged exposure just to give them tools for regulating the nervous system. And then when you're, when you're doing prolonged exposure work, a lot of people drop out of it. I mean, PE can work, 
but a lot of people drop out because you're having to talk about the story over and over. So what we're teaching them is basically some of the things you've heard us talk about today in recon is how you, you know, you do up some preparation before they have to tell that story. You even take them into desired future self so they can end that story differently before they retell it. So there are some things you can do. And what the clinicians are telling us is, oh my gosh, this is helping. You know, it's helping me um, see things differently. It's helping me manage my own stress and it's mm-hmm. helping me right. give my veterans some other tools they can use. And they are enjoying them. Like they're they're enjoying the process and you know, even though they talk about some, the word hypnosis, sometimes people get spooked by it, mm-hmm. but once they experience it, they'll actually say, oh, you know what? We did some of this in basic training when I was learning how to sight a rifle. Yeah. Same mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Focused attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, at the same time, I want to let people know who are, who are watching or listening that uh, this isn't, your work isn't just for uh, you know, veterans, uh, administration people, you actually have, um, well, you have had live trainings up until this uh, uh, last two years we're dealing with the COVID issue, but uh, you also have uh, online training. And uh, I think you have uh, told me repeatedly how surprised you were, and I've witnessed it firsthand working with you, how good people can get who are motivated to learn through even doing an online course uh, that you offer. Cause I know you break things into groups so that their people are always supervised and, and learning. So in, in this last few minutes, can you tell us a little bit about how you structure? Uh, so if somebody wanted to learn trauma informed hypnotherapy and you're offering an online course, how, how's that set up and, and how do you work that? Thank you for asking. So When we created our training program in 2020, when we all were forced to go online and um, and work with in the VA, you know, um, hats off to the VA for helping. We collaborated together to figure out how can we train clinicians online. So what we developed, and we're really proud of it because we've done research on outcomes of this training model. And what we do is um, I offer an eight week course. Um, so that you have four to five, 15 to 20 minute pre-recorded instructional videos a week. So it works out to like, if you just watch one 15 to 20 minute video a day, you're going to, um, you know, get, it it makes the material more digestible. It makes it manageable in your busy day. Mm -hmm. And then we follow each week of pre-recorded material with um, a live uh, webinar and practice session and with the you know the magic of zoom now we can break into small practice groups so we bring in um you know every week we've got a particular skill we practice so in the beginning on our webinars we'll just talk a little bit about how to utilize that skill maybe do a demo and then we break people into small groups of three to four people where they can practice the skill with each other. And, um, and Paul's one of our um, coaches in those groups. He's done a fabulous job. And, um, and what we found is over the eight weeks, people doubled their effect- effectiveness, literally, because we did a research study on it where we had people, and granted, it's a subjective evaluation, But as the coaches in the program, we also had observation of people from start to finish. And we can, you know, confidently say that from some where somebody started to the end, we saw probably improvement by at least 50 to 100 percent in a lot of our clinicians. The other thing we found is that people said this model train them so much better. So we did have people who had previously attended three to four day trainings through ASH or other organizations. And they, I'm not knocking those trainings, but what they said is, you know what, when I went to the ASH trainings and even my trainings where you have the three day weekend trainings, I enjoyed the training, but I didn't use it. I didn't feel confident enough to use it. So I had to go to basic training 
three or four times before I actually started using it. What we found with our model, our eight week model, they started using it during the class because every week you're learning a new induction and how to use it. They felt more confident about using it. And by the end of it, I mean, they're actually using it and feeling confident mm -hmm. in their ability to use it for anxiety, chronic pain and trauma. So, so I'm so excited. We found a training model that is very effective and that people enjoy and it's manageable in your busy schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I, I think sometimes we all, and it, not just hypnosis training. So, you know, we, we, our brains get overwhelmed with too much info anyway. And that's one thing I, I do want to say about your, your, your work and your program is you've been able to, um, give the the good stuff at the beginning in a foundational way so that all the other things that I've seen uh and again I'm this is Paul talking not Courtney I've seen a lot of other hypnosis trainings that there's a, a lot more focus on history uh elaborate setups things that I think are important but for someone who wants to like in a couple of weeks actually use it it, it gives them a, a grounding uh, so that once that ground is there, when they do want to go up, there's such a good foundation in place that, that they're able to, you know, go to other trainings and, and feel that they're uh, seeing things that they, they might not have, you know, the first time. So, yeah, that's that is definitely one of our focuses. I know it is in your trainings, too, mm -hmm. Paul. You know, we want you to have practical. We want to make it practical. Mm -hmm. Um and so we want to give you enough of the history, for example, that you kind of know the context of hypnosis, but not so much, you know, that you're, I mean, you want to get out there and use it and you want to know how can I apply it in these different ways. And that's what our focus is. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you, I really appreciate you talking uh, with me today. And I think you've given everybody kind of a, uh, a different way to see tra uh, trance and trauma and also uh, giving them some idea of how your work. And I think that recon um, acronym is very uh, helpful. And uh, I would recommend uh, uh, Courtney's books, as well as obviously her training, uh, if you want to delve a little more into it. So I, I really appreciate you talking to me today. Last question, uh, do you have any advice for someone who is uh, wanting, uh, you know, obviously not a sales pitch, but is wanting to learn hypnosis in general to deal with trauma uh, clients, any, any little tidbits of, uh, you know, advice you may give them? Yeah, you know, I think the, the main takeaway is hypnosis can be a really helpful tool for, for people who've experienced trauma, but it's a helpful tool when you're using it to help them elicit the desired response mm -hmm. that they want to have. So ego strengthening, desired future self, like it, you use it to instill hope and to help them feel like I can calm my nervous system. I can get in touch with my strengths. I do have resilience. So, you know, um, so, so use hypnosis in that way and you'll find that your clients really resonate with it. I mean, we know that people who've been through trauma are actually very responsive to hypnosis, mm -hmm. but when you present it, if they're a little afraid of the H word, um, you know, just say, would you like for me to, to guide you? Like I, sometimes I just call it a guided meditation or, you know, a lot of people have found a guided imagery experience that can help them access the feeling they want to have or get back in touch with can be really helpful. Would you like for me to show you how to do that? Um, most people are open to that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, Courtney, thanks for uh, talking with me today. And uh, I, I appreciate all the work that you're, you're doing out there. And I, I'm looking forward to, to more of it. Me, I'm looking forward to more of your work and your books. Thank Fabulous you. stuff. Thank you. I appreciate it.